Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's well caffeinated um, and that I don't bore people too much with this. Uh, so I'm uh, going to present um, some findings from uh, an external evaluation that OXO Policy Management is conducting of the Benazir Income Support Program. Um, and so I'll go through briefly the, the background to the, the BIS program, followed by an introduction to the evaluation and the sort of research design, uh, and then some very, very preliminary results, um, and finally a sort of summary of the, the potential of a program like the BISP. Um, so first of all, the background to the BISP program. Now, the BISP was launched uh, in uh, 2008, um, and it's a key pillar of the, the National Social Protection Strategy. And it was formulated in response to the food price shocks in 2008. Um, and uh, in 2010, 2011, a comprehensive national poverty survey was conducted to identify eligible households based on a proxy means test. And this was done in, in conjunction with the World Bank. And what this means is that the beneficiaries were identified um, using poverty as a criteria. Um, payments uh, were made to female, to fe eligible females within, uh, no, payments were made to uh, ever married females with, within eligible households. So based on the National Poverty Survey, uh, the government identified households which fell within the, the poverty threshold, so that was around 20% of the poorest households in Pakistan. And then within the households, they identified families, and then one ever married adult woman in each family was identified and was seen as a recipient of the, the cash transfer program. And this was done as a measure to promote women's empowerment. Um, payments of 3,000 rupees, which is about $30, um, are made once a quarter. Um, and originally payments were meant to be made once a month, but then they were bunched together into quarterly payments. And I believe recently this has been increased to 1,200 rupees. Um, there are two main delivery mechanisms of the cash transfer program. Uh, one is money orders delivered directly to the doorstep by Pakistan Post. This sort of started out as the main delivery mechanism, but over time this has been uh, shelved off and, and they've switched, BISP has now switched to using a debit card. Uh, I must also add that there are small pilot schemes which are experimenting with things like a smart card, which is slightly different from a, a debit card. Uh, I, th I believe there's some experimentation with mobile money as well. Um, but these are the two main, two main mechanisms. Um, now, this is a, a huge cash transfer program, and it's really one of its kind in terms of being an unconditional cash transfer program, which is poverty targeted. Um, and so this is a huge operational challenge, and, and currently uh, there are just over 5 million direct beneficiaries of the, of the program. Now, there are a range of complementary programs that have been designed over time. Um, so in, in addition to the unconditional cash transfer, BISP is piloting various complementary programs. One is Vasilai Talim, which is a conditional cash transfer program, which aims to get out of kids uh, out of school children into school. Uh, the other is Vasilai Rozgar, which aims at providing uh, demand driven vocational training um, to young people within eligible households. Uh, then there's something called Vasilai Huck, which is an extension of uh, small loans to female beneficiaries. Uh, and then Vasilai Sehat, which is um, to provide health insurance to beneficiaries. And they're all at various stages of, of implementation. But the the main program which has been rolled out is the unconditional cash transfer. Now, I will now go through the research design. So, um, social protection is still at a fairly nascent phase, uh, nascent stage in Pakistan. And before BIS began, we had the Zakat program, the Betul Mal program, and we had bits and pieces of, of social protection programs, but really this is the first program which takes a, a holistic approach towards, towards social strategy. And what was envisioned was that a, a, a rigorous external impact evaluation would, would really help provide evidence on whether this program works or not, um, and will, will help the program to develop over time as well. Um, and we know that a cash, transfer, a cash transfer is not a magic bullet for poverty reduction. 
Um, and an evaluation can, can also help identify complementary interventions that, that may be required to support the BIS program. Um, so, therefore, how do we measure the impact of the BISP? Now, um, we are trying to come up with, or we can, we've come up with, we think, an evaluation design which is uh, robust to, to critique and which is, um, and it fits with how the implementers want to implement the program. Um, so following extensive stakeholder consultations, uh, we developed a research design, a national survey was implemented and it targeted two groups of households. Uh, one group of households which sat below the BISP poverty scorecard threshold, another group of households which sat just above the BISP poverty scorecard threshold. And uh, what we aim to do is to look at the difference between the households which sit just above and just below the threshold in order for us to measure impact. And uh, in total, we surveyed about 8,675 households in around 500 communities across the country. So a huge survey. Um, these are some of the key impact areas against which the program is being assessed. And these were sort of developed with the help of some qualitative research as well. So we could really narrow down on, on what we wanted to investigate. So the first is, uh, the first research area is poverty and livelihoods. And the standard hypothesis is that a monthly injection of cash may have first order effects on household expenditure, um, lifting beneficiaries out of poverty. The second is vulnerability to shocks, and the hypothesis is that a reliable source of household income may help beneficiaries insure themselves against shocks, and it also may help beneficiaries not uh, revert to damaging coping strategies. Um, the third impact area is child nutrition, and uh, the hypothesis is that if households get money, they consume more food or better quality food, and there's some impact on nutrition indicators. Um, the next uh, impact area is child labor, and the hypothesis is that if households are being provided um, with a cash transfer, then that reduces child labor. Uh, the next is women's empowerment, which was, uh, and we assume that perhaps in the long run, giving a cash transfer and making the woman the recipient of the cash transfer will help um, increase the decision-making power of women within the household. Um, second last is health, and one of the most common reasons cited in national surveys for not seeking health treatment, formal health treatment, is that it's too expensive. So one could hypothesize that a cash transfer uh, would um, improve health-seeking behavior. Uh, may improve health-seeking behavior. Uh, the same goes for education, where one of the most commonly cited constraints is the inability to afford education or schooling expenditure in general. Uh, and the hypothesis is that such a cash transfer would help um, change that. So how do we measure impact? Um, now, what we couldn't do was an RCT, because the program was being rolled out to everyone who sat within the, uh, who sat below the threshold, so we couldn't randomize treatment. So this is a quasi-experimental uh, research design, and this is a hypothetical situation. Uh, and what, the, uh, what this shows is basically that we focus on households in close proximity to the poverty score threshold. So on the um, x-axis, you have the uh, normalized BIS poverty score, and the vertical line sort of shows the cutoff point. People on the right are non-beneficiaries, and you can see that's because they're less poor. People on the left are beneficiaries, and that's because they're poorer. And what we want to really focus on is the, the, point, where, the point where it cuts the, the vertical line. And we would want to look at people just above the cutoff point and just below the cutoff point. And the, the, how this works is that if given a treatment, you would assume that after a period of time, you would see a discontinuity in, in, in the distribution. And then you measure the difference in the discontinuities to, to get at impact. Now, we have received, uh, so we collected baseline data in 2011, about March 2011. And then we did the follow up in March 2013. So after two years, the first follow up. 
Um, and we've received, so we started receiving the clean data a while ago, uh, and we're working on the, the follow-up report. And these are some very preliminary results from the, the follow-up uh, data. Um, so this graph is basically uh, presents results from the follow-up data, and uh, it's quite interesting because it shows very high levels of satisfaction um, within uh, four beneficiaries. So majority of the beneficiaries cite being either satisfied or very satisfied with the payments mechanism. And what you can see is the right-hand side column shows BISP debit card, the left Pakistan post. And more people are satisfied receiving money through the BISP debit card. Um, however, there are some problems with the delivery of payments. Now, beneficiaries are supposed to receive quarterly payments of about of 3,000 rupees. And what we find, so self-reported um, data, is that in the 12 months preceding our 2013 um, survey, the majority of the people received either three transfers or two transfers. S only 17% of the beneficiaries received all four transfers. And the majority of the beneficiaries receive the full amount of transfer. However, there is some leakage. So the average reported value of a transfer is 2,900 rupees instead of 3,000 rupees. Um, the, the graph here basically um, presents a, quite a stark difference between Balochistan and the rest of the country. So the, the payment, operationally, the payments look very similar for Punjab, Sindh, and KPK, but there's a massive difference in Balochistan where about 30% of the people haven't received a single payment in the preceding 12 months. Um, so that was a difference which, which was sort of worth pointing out. Um, the next slide is on how the transfer is being used, and there aren't many surprises here, really. The majority of the respondents, about over 80% of the respondents, uh, report spending the transfer on food and, and nutrition, followed by 60% for health care and then for clothing. Um, only 5% report spending any money on education, and a very negligible 1% report saving the transfer. Then, um, and, and sort of to explain why, the, the BISP households are extremely poor and extremely food insecure. Um, the average uh, per adult monthly equivalent consumption expenditure is just 1,700 rupees, at, was 1,700 rupees at the baseline. And this is lower than the national poverty line, which is at around 1,800 rupees. Um, so already these households are extremely poor. And this means that the, the households are living, the individuals within the households are living on less than dollar a day. Now, we also found out at the baseline that the, the best beneficiary households are surviving on less than the recommended 2,350 calories per day. Um, and the average poverty gap at baseline um, is 284 rupees per month. Um, and the, the transfer itself is sort of 113 rupees, so that's on an individual, on an individual basis. And that amounts to about 40% of the, the value of the poverty gap. So in relative terms, the cash transfer is quite small. Um, and this means that the complementary interventions that have been designed around BISP, so the conditional cash transfer program, the health insurance program, um, are very, very important. Now, these are some very preliminary results on welfare, and this sort of shows that in terms of per adult equivalent uh, monthly consumption expenditure, overall there has been an increase for both treatment households and for control households. However, we do see an, an impact on uh, the BISP beneficiary households. So for the BISP beneficiary households, there's an increase in per adult monthly uh, consumption expenditure by about 100 rupees. Uh, and that's not unexpected. I mean, they are getting cash. But what this means is that it's almost equal to the value, the, the value of the individual cash transfer, which is 113 rupees. So almost all of the money that's, that's being given to these households is, is being consumed. Um, and we, we'd also like to point out that the the BIS beneficiary households are 
ec uh, survive on extremely vulnerable um, livelihoods. So what this shows is a comparison between the sort of national data on, based on PSLM and the best beneficiary data from 2013, the follow-up data. And beneficiary households are, are largely occupied in elementary occupations, and these are occupations um, such as casual labor, uh, unskilled work, very unreliable work, work which looks, uh, which relies on daily rates. Um, and this means that households are extremely vulnerable to exogenous shocks. And this presents a, a sort of a summary of the types of shocks that are experienced by households. And these, I mean, the, the largest one uh, is the food price rise, which is why, it was one reason why the, the program was initiated anyways. But this is followed by things like uh, illnesses, um, households damaged and flooding, lower crop yields, displacement, uh, loss of salaried employment. And we know that the theory tells us that with a lack of insurance, temporary shocks like these can have persistent effects. So they could lead to a reduction in human capital, they could lead to a reduction in physical assets, um, and they could lead to poor nutrition in children and then consequently poor learning outcomes in, in the future. And regular and reliable payments under BISP can help to insure households against these shocks. Now, households are particularly vulnerable to covariate shocks. So these are shocks, unlike idiosyncratic shocks, which are experienced at the community level. So these are things like floods, for example. And what this means is that traditional coping mechanisms break down for households. So if the entire village is, is faced with a, a calamity, then there's nowhere to go and borrow money from. You can't do that. So then you resort to really harmful coping strategies, such as reducing food consumption, such as consuming lower cost foods. Um, and as I just uh, said, that this is very, very damaging for, for um, future nutrition outcomes, for future learning outcomes, for future incomes. Um, we also hope that the BISP evaluation will contribute to a growing body of evidence on whether or not cash transfers have any impact on female empowerment. And at the moment, the, the impact is mixed. And I'm not going to go into the details because of the time. But um, from the Oportunidades program in Mexico, I mean, several papers have looked at it. And some have found a positive impact on empowerment. Others have not, uh, based on different proxies that they've used. Um, and these are some of the papers which say that. But um, what we did was uh, in the baseline and then at the follow-up, we uh, had a separate questionnaire for eligible females in the, in the household. And there was a, a, a module which sort of looked at some empowerment indicators. Uh, we, find, we found at baseline that many women didn't leave the houses unaccompanied. And we find that that's still the case at follow-up two years on. Um, however, we did find a, a significant increase in uh, the percentage of women who said they could now go to their friend's house without uh, being accompanied. Um, at the same time, we still find that women can access only very small amounts of money in an emergency. Um, and we don't find any evidence that, that BISP has changed that. So receiving the money doesn't mean that, that they're able to, uh, to spend or they're allowed to spend that money even in a case of an emergency. Um, and you can see that the values of sort of how much they can access is, ranges from just 50 to 1,000 rupees. Um, so what is the potential impact of BIS? Now, the BIS transfer will directly provide support to the poorest households, and it will, it will help some really um, food insecure households who are already well below the, the national poverty line. Um, it will help households cope with, with exogenous shocks, and it may prevent extremely damaging coping strategies that, that households often in rural areas resort to in, in face of uh, food price shocks. Um, it can also help leverage stepwise changes during, um, towards more sustainable livelihoods. So this is for sure a very long-term measure. But by being able to, to afford um, food, uh, children will have better nutrition. Children will be able to, uh, ch you know, the, the money may be spent on education, and especially if you couple it with complementary interventions, then we can foresee a more positive change towards sustainable livelihoods in the future. Um, 
the, the transfer may, may also help promote, promote women's empowerment. And I mean, this is a measure which takes a long time to, to change. It's, it's not something that would change over a year or even two years. But the fact that, that women are direct recipients and that they're encouraged to get CNICs, and that we've seen that a lot of the women at the, in the baseline, they couldn't register because they didn't, they didn't have a CNIC. A CNIC is a, a national ID card. And that because of the, the program, they had to actually go and, and get registered. Um, so perhaps there might be an impact on some sort of impact on female empowerment uh, based around that. Um, and obviously, the BIS transfer in combination with the conditional cash transfer, which is Vasila Talim, can directly improve um, education outcomes of, of children in, in beneficiary households. Uh, but really, the main sort of takeaway point is that this is a huge operational challenge and a, a cash transfer program quite unique, uh, not maybe unique, but the fact that it's an unconditional cash transfer program, it's, it's being delivered all over the country in extremely tough uh, conditions. Uh, so there's an achievement, um, I think, in, in how BISP has operationalized the program, the fact that most people are receiving payments, and the fact that we have started to see, at least from prelimi preliminary analysis, some impact of the program. Um, so um, that is it. I mean, we would be very keen to share the, the results once the final analysis is out, but this is where we are. Um, thank you.